Hello everyone, and welcome back to another episode of the Reading Party Podcast with Megan and Lexi. This episode continues our season looking at stories inspired by or set in ancient Egypt. Some of the material includes themes of violence or sexual assault. It is not suitable for under 18s. We hope you have your favourite beverages and snacks ready to go, because we've got our teas and are ready to start spilling the tea on our latest ancient story. Hello everyone and welcome back to the Reading Party podcast. After a movie week we are now back with another book. It is the second in the Egypt series by Wilbur Smith. We do have our book. We have part we one do. of Warlock and so I had read this before but it's been many years because as I've been re-listening I'm like I don't remember that. I don't remember that at all. So I like vaguely remembered what happened. So it was a really good refresher. But having had some familiarity with it, as you know, I still feel like I have some sort of advantage. So I'm going to start with you and say, before you get into your little summary, what are you thinking? Like, especially since we just did River God not too long ago. Hmm. I have a lot of the same problems, which is, unex well, no, it's not unexpected. It's expected, but kind of disappointing. And a lot of the plot feels very, very similar to River God. And we'll obviously get into that as we go. I'm enjoying it. It's a good read. It's very well written. And the description is fantastic, just with as with River God. And I have a really good feeling for like the sights and sounds and the atmosphere and the scenery that they're moving through, which is lovely. The bad guy is unrelentingly bad and very unlikable again similar to river god he doesn't seem to have any redeeming features at all and the good guys are unrelentingly good but taita is more bearable for me this time i think because it's not written in first person narrative it's third person so you don't have the <laughs> continual self-congratulations of taita's own special brand of genius he is still a genius obviously because it wouldn't be taita if he wasn't a genius and also somehow a magical sorcerer type dude. I'm enjoying it. Sorry, this is all very pessimistic and a bit of a downer. I'm enjoying myself. I have a lot of problems with it, but I am enjoying the read. Yeah, yeah. I mean, I think, again, a book quite of its time, very dated language, some questionable language, very questionable language. But yeah, would you tell us just a little bit about what happened in part one? Yes. So we open and it's, what, 60 years after the events of River God. Taita is somehow still alive and is a like a figure of awe and reverence among the general Egyptian population. He's become something of a legend. And you learn that after Lustris's death, he went out into the wilderness and gained all of these magical powers. And then Lustris came to him in a dream and told him, essentially, you can't hide out here for the rest of your life. I have things I need you to do go back to the city. Oh, and by the way, when you die, you will have a penis again. And you can come and be with me with your penis and it will be magical and wonderful. And I was like, oh my God. Okay, good. We're opening with this. Fantastic. So the story follows Taita, obviously, and Memnon's son, Nefer, who seems like a super cool dude. He's a kid. He has his impetuous, childish things, but he seems really nice. And Memnon is killed very early on in the book by a Hyksos invader. Brah, no, except that the reader knows it wasn't actually a Hyksos invader. It was his best friend, Naja, who was the commander of his army, also has a Hyksos mother, but no one else seems to know that. So Naja kills Memnon and then has himself proclaimed regent because Nefer is too young to become king. And the story kind of goes from there. Taita tries to smuggle Nefer out of Egypt and fails, so ends up convincing Naja that he is in fact going to work for him because the gods have revealed to him through the mazes of Amun that Naja is actually supposed to be pharaoh. So Taita is going to do everything he can to make that happen. And he does that 
or pretends to do that for a little while, managed to broker a peace deal between the upper Egyptian Hyksos people and the, well, no, the lower Egyptian Hyksos, uh, it's this north-south thing, the Hyksos ruling in the delta in lower Egypt and the native Egyptian pharaohs ruling in upper Egypt manages to broker a peace be deal between them. So they are ruling as like dual pharaohs and it's super cool and very nice. And also, by the way, the Hyksos princess falls madly in love with Nefer from afar because that's what princesses do in these books. They fall in love with Egyptian princes and Saita manages to very very sensibly suggest to the Hyksos king that maybe she should marry Nefer because that would really solidify the peace between their two kingdoms. So their engagement is announced publicly and it's all very nice and wonderful, except that Troc, who is a lord of the Hyksos, is very angry, very angry because he's in love with Princess, I think Minnetaka is how you say her name. So that happens. It's lovely. It's angry, but it's lovely. And too many N names. Naja ends up marrying Nefer's sisters, one older sister, one younger sister. Older sister ends up being completely on board with Naja's plan to kill her brother, which was a bit of a shock. Not going to lie, did not see that one coming, but she's absolutely on board with it. Fantastic, good, wonderful. And in the midst of all of this, Troc manages to kill all of the Hyksos ruling family, except Minotaka, who he whisks back to Avalos. That's wrong. Avaris. Avaris, thank you. I was trying to say Avalon. I was like, no, 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 that's the wrong country, the wrong time period, the wrong mythology entirely. Yes, so Avaris, he whisks her back to Avaris, forcibly marries her. There's a very unnecessary, deeply uncomfortable attempted rape scene. So read with caution if you are planning on reading this. And Minotaka essentially like fights him off. He beats her. It's deeply unpleasant. And at the same time, while all this is going on, Naja is sick because he got attacked by a lion and the wounds went septic. Taita manages to save him, but pretends that he is in fact dead so that he can spirit him away out of Egypt and away from Nefer and his scheming wife, who is also Nefer's older sister. So we end the story with Taita and Nefer have just rescued Minotaka from Avaris and they are speeding away towards Assyria well, Babylon. We will also get to the Mesopotamian stuff in a couple of minutes, but they're speeding away towards Babylon and Troc is in hot pursuit with chariots and with his own team of magicians, magi, who are busy casting spells to try and outwit Taita as they are fleeing. So yes, in very broad strokes, that's the plot so far. And I've obviously skimmed over very essential plot points and little details and interesting bits of the story. So Lexi, do you have anything you want to add that is crucial that I have missed? I mean, you kind of covered the main plot points because I feel like at its core, that's basically what happens. Yeah. I mean, I think we can start digging into a lot of the the smaller details that happen and piece together sort of the rough timeline. But yeah, no, I mean, that's, yeah. Good job. Good job. I mean, and again, it's a very massive book for anyone who does not know how big this thing is. It's huge, kind of like River God. They're really big. So there's a lot. And then again, Wilbur Smith's beautiful writing style is like, there's a lot of just, there's a ton of exposition, like everywhere. So again, it makes it big. But yeah, I guess... I don't know about you, Megan, but this seems to be a reaction I get every time I come to any of the books in the series after River God. I get, like, nostalgic for the original because I love it so much. So I just get very, like, sad because I have to remind myself all the other characters that I love are dead. And you get Memnon for the first, like, two, three chapters, whatever. And then he's dead. And, and you don't he... even get a lot of him. He's kind of yeah. there in the background. Yeah. No, you get like one scene really with him talking to Nefer and you have just the expedition to when he goes out with Naja before he dies. And like, because Naja's so hell-bent on like keeping him away from the surgeon so he can't get help he kind of dies in a really unceremonious way and that always throws me because i'm just like this is a character that we saw grow up with taita and we love him 
And so he hasn't even been Pharaoh Tomosa long enough for me to be like, yes, that's Pharaoh Tomosa. I'm so just like, it's little Mem. So then when he like dies in the chariot and you don't even like notice because you're not told exactly when he dies, you just get sort of like, and Nefer put him in the chariot and then he drove kind of slowly to delay. And then you're like, he arrives. Oh, but the king died somewhere along the way. And you're like, why does he get such an unceremonious send off when like, Lostris got the big weepy goodbye and you're like crying your eyes out and then you know Tannis gets the big goodbye so it's interesting like I understand what he was doing with his characters like you have to kind of move the story along and he wants you to fall in love with like a whole book's worth of new characters and you're supposed to really love Mintaka and you're supposed to love Nefer but I don't know. I kind of had a problem immediately with the unceremonious way in which we bid farewell to Memnon slash Tomosa. Did I you? Also, yeah, no, I absolutely had an issue with that. It felt just bizarre. And Taita didn't seem to have, I don't know, he didn't seem to have a terribly strong reaction to it. Yes, when it happens, he's out in the wilderness and then he's concentrating on trying to keep Nefer alive and get him out of Egypt. But then when he gets back, there's very little emotional response and that might be because again the book's not written in first person this time so you don't get that internal narrative but it felt odd and there's also no mention of Memnon's mother Masara who is a central character in River God at least for the last half of the book and she isn't mentioned once I don't know if she's dead I don't know if she's been just confined to the harem by Naja like I don't know what's happened at all. I assume she's dead because if she's alive, then surely she's a, a viable contender for regent, given her son is next in line to the throne. Yes, it was odd. It definitely feels like Taita is really the only character that carries over from River God, which is, it feels strange for a sequel. Yeah, I mean, I guess when you deal with time jumps, like, I guess, and then when you set up your main character to have become this mystic shaman-like magical, because they spend, you know, like, in this book, he's called Magus all the time, because you're like, oh, yes, you are a mystical being who has found the secret to eternal life and this, that, and the other thing. So, yeah, I mean, I don't know. He did try in a bit of exposition to explain why... An illustrious pharaoh from a very great lineage, quote unquote, would only have like two daughters and one son. I mean, he did try to say, you know, there was that yellow plague or flower, whatever it was, that came and like killed. And he did say like it killed off like all of his other children. He didn't yeah. mention. What happened to, to Masara? Like, it's just not. Right. He didn't mention her but like i'm gonna just guess that it killed off like all of his wives and his children because yeah he really spends time saying like the only survivors of this other than pharaoh were nefer and his two daughters so you're like okay so i guess that explains it sort of but yeah i don't know now in this one as well because of the time jump you have the Hyksos being firmly entrenched now. You have the kingdoms being firmly separated. But you also have stories of, like, Lower Egypt being Egyptian but not Egyptian. It's, like, a weird place to pick up your story. But at the same time, like, I guess it makes sense. Sort of. I don't know. Like... Yeah. So the timeline has always been something sort of of debate for me. I've always just kind of been like, I guess that makes sense, but I don't like it. But I don't know really what you would do differently because it's not like he's time jumping like 200 years. You know, you're like, it's only 60. So, well, I guess we did kind of like Kratos is still around, but he's like an old man. Yeah. And he really, again, I was actually really upset with the way he was written out. So for our listeners... Kratos by now is a really old man, like way past his prime, and he's kind of being described as being the kind of fat, rich old man who can retire because he's just there. And when Tomosa is killed, he essentially knows what's up and is like, Naja, this is you. Yeah. Like, I can tell. 
because Naja essentially terrifies the shit out of the rest of like the state assembly and everyone else, he succeeds in essentially sort of ignoring it and being like, well, I was already declared regent and now you can't stop me. Ha ha ha. And then like brutally murders Kratos and then disowns like it takes all of his land, all of his possessions and he's dismembered and not allowed to be like buried. Isn't he? He's left with yeah. the criminals. Yeah. So I don't know. Like, I guess I don't like how Wilbur Smith treats his former characters like, and no one's spared from it. Young, old, Tate is really the person who comes through it relatively unscathed. Yeah. I said, I don't know. Why does he have such rage against his, like, former characters? I think it's to help set up Naja as this unrelentingly evil person, which I don't feel like you need to do. You can do it with a little bit more subtlety and maybe give him a bit more character complexity instead of making him essentially Jafar from Aladdin. It is definitely the sense I'm getting here. He's he's just evil. He's slimy and smarmy and evil, and he likes to wear a lot of jewelry, and he has a weird obsession with perfume. And there isn't anything good about him. And there wasn't anything good about, what was his name? Lord Imtep? Imhotep? It wasn't Imhotep. Intef. Intef. There we go. Lord Intef. He was just an evil bastard. And Naja's very much the same. And I think Mem and Karata being killed in the way that they are just kind of... I think it's done to solidify it in the reader's mind how much of an unlikable person this man is. But I don't know. I'm not sure it was seriously necessary. I guess I just don't... Well, in this day and age, we're so used to so many shades of gray, so you see all the layers. I feel like, you know, this book was written in, like, 1997 or 8 or something. So, I don't know. Gray like, hadn't been want... invented yet. Yeah, I was like, so did people want more of a black and white because this is very like his characters are very black and white very you are bad you are good i don't necessarily think it's a literary failing of the 90s because there are plenty of, of fantastic books with a lot more complexity i think it's just how wilbur smith writes i think this is just how he he prefers to draw his characters which is fine it makes it really easy to work out you know who's gonna <laughs> who's going to win in the end but it as a reader it's a little frustrating and yes I liked Krata very much in River God, and this didn't feel super great. Yeah. Because, yeah, yeah. Well, and it's interesting, though, because he does try to go for some of the complex, like, he clearly goes on about how the Egyptians don't like anyone from the Hyksosian line. They don't like their strange customs. But then, again, you have, like, kind of the trope from the first book where you have young Egyptian prince... We're considering her foreign, I guess, princess? She's foreign in that she's Hyksos, but she's presented as almost entirely Egyptianized. Because she's a devotee of the goddess Hathor, and she was born in Navaris. And like, she has Hyksos family, but she is drawn very much as an Egyptian woman with some little exotic physical characteristics. And I'm yeah. using exotic very deliberately because the language in this book makes my skin crawl in places. Yeah, yeah, no, the way that she's described, I was like, oh, okay, that's awkward. Can we take a very brief aside and mention Wilbur Smith's bizarre fascination with nipples? Yes! I have, okay. like, a crystal clear picture of the nipples of every woman in this book. It doesn't matter if they're wearing clothing, because you can see the nipples through the clothing. And you know if they are... Like, what color they are, what shape they are, if they are erect, whether or not they've put makeup on them. Like, what? Really? It's not even just that. I mean, he always talks about the shape of their breast. He's just like, and her breasts were like two grapefruits, or her breasts were not yet of the right, harvest. The way he talks about kind. the youngest daughter is really, it's giving me, like, early lustrous vibes. Like, these kids, our kids, stop sexualizing them. For the love of God, please. Like, the, the youngest daughter is married and then sent back to the nursery. Why are we talking about her body? Stop it! Stop! Bad man! It's really disturbing. And every time he does it, like, well, I used to ignore it because I was like, okay, I'm comfy, so we're going to read this and we're just going to go on. But, like, coming back to it as an adult, because I swear to God, last time I read this, I think I was like... 
13, 14, I want to say. About the age, actually, of the older daughter being married off. Creepy. But yeah, I guess like I ignored it before because I was just like, okay, whatever, that's weird. But yeah, as an adult, I'm kind of like, this is really disturbing. But also, there has to be a purpose, right? This cannot just be like... I think it's entirely gratuitous because he doesn't describe any of the men in any of the same terms. But we do get a lot of descriptions of gross men's penises, though. That is true. So it goes on both sides. So I feel That's like true. it's a very deliberate attempt to either really, really describe what's happening and really just scene setting down to the last detail. Or he just wants to be gratuitous on both sides. Because, I mean, we have in that trigger warning, violent attempted rape, but not successful rape scene between Mintaka and Trock, like he does take a lot of time to be like oh yes and as she's fighting she feels his like very uh. big hard penis against her stomach and then you get that very very visual and visceral description of him basically ejaculating on her stomach and I was like see so like different terms but again it's like a very visual it wasn't necessary and it didn't happen in river god this is very different because in river god when there's a sex scene it's kind of like through a soft focus um like diaphanous curtainy thing and and maybe try to hear something or maybe it's like the morning after you don't get this very graphic when Naja consummates his marriage with Nefa's oldest sister, whose name I absolutely cannot remember, but that's equally graphic. It's consensual, thank God, but much more graphic than anything that we saw in River God. And then the scene with Minotaka and Troc is unnecessarily graphic. You could have had the same effect, I think, with someone hearing her screaming from outside the room and then her maids comforting her the next day and her saying well i'm still a virgin or you know something to that effect so you know it was attempted rape not effective not like he, there was no penetration it, attempted rape feels weird because that felt very much like violation and rape regardless of where he ejaculated but it was unnecessary i think for the book and yeah very odd departure unexpected departure from what we saw in river god I mean, on some level, right, just thinking about all the different adaptations, because this is not the first time that we've dealt with this kind of subject matter. It happens all over the ancient world, unfortunately. So there's a lot of this. But I'm like, is this Wilbur Smith's, like, clunky attempt to do, like, a, a Pat Barker, Silence of the Girls type of, he wants to capture, like, the horrificness of what it would have been like, but is doing it in, like, a really viscerally clunky gratuitous way because like i'm like people don't write stuff just randomly to write it right so i'm kind of like even though we think it's unnecessary like he probably had an idea right so is this like a badly done pat barker i don't know i don't know because i mean pat barker got a lot of like rape and assault and the visceral ho just horrors of war and being a slave like she nailed that right but again like she didn't do it with this kind of language but like we still got it so i'm thinking maybe this is and you know what this is the biggest difference as well between like how a man tells a story of this kind of violence and how a woman tells it because essentially it's the same kind of thing describing all these sort of violent assaults and things but like the way that you get it through Pat Barker's work. It comes through just it's the same, but you don't yeah. use this. Yeah. So I feel like, you know, maybe that's what he was going for. Because I don't know why else. Because, like, the only thing that the rape sort of, or attempted rape or whatever we want to call it, like, the only thing it really did was, like, tell me, Trock was evil before, but now I hate him even more. So, like, was the point to, like, bring me to a simmering rage of, like, oh, man, I can't remember the last time I hated a character more and was, like, I really want you to fucking die. Like, if that's what he wanted to elicit, well, fantastic. Because guess what? I felt it the whole time. Congratulations. Right? Like, the whole time you're listening to that, or I'm listening to that, I'm like, I hate him. I hate him. 
you know, and then you get the whole, and she tries to punch him. And you're like, yes. Oh, that did nothing. Well, shit. Now I hate him even more. Like, I found myself physically grimacing as I'm listening to this. And I don't know if, like, it makes it worse because I'm listening to this being told with a fantastic narrator who makes all the voices. And so it's, like, ten times worse because he has that, like, horrible... He he does the voice so well that you're, like, completely creeped out. So I don't know if it's worse because I'm listening to it and, you know, I'm not reading it in my head. And, you know, there's something to be said for when you read it yourself, you can kind of slow things down or speed things up or take stuff out so yeah it's a really interesting way to take this in as well i was also frustrated with minotaur's failure to kill him which maybe sounds weird but earlier on in the book when you first meet her a lot is made of her being a really skilled maybe not warrior but fighter and she's really great with the bow and there's a scene where truck is driving her around in a chariot and she's shooting off arrows and taita is like seriously impressed with this girl and then when she goes on a picnic with nefa she manages to bring down more birds than he does when they go hunting and that's like a point of contention between the two she is really good she's like a strong physical person and the comment is made about how hyksos women are like not as delicate as Egyptian women, and they can take care of themselves. So you get the feeling that this woman could probably do some damage if she really wanted to. And then she tries to, what, spear truck in the stomach with a, a dagger when he comes His back. Sword. Yeah, right. When he comes back into the room and he just evades her and then physically assaults her. It was annoying because it was this she's set up as this really strong person and yes truck is super big and has warriors instincts and all this magical garbage but come on let her land a blow for the love of god don't make it so that she has got to be rescued again by another dude yeah it's the same sorry it's the same plot line as river god there's a, mm-hmm. a magical foreign princess who must be rescued by a man. And, and while she's very strong and capable and independent and super intelligent, she has to be rescued by a man. And I don't know if it's just that we spent last season reading some fantastic feminist retellings of the Odyssey and the Iliad, or if I'm just angry, but it was really annoying to read. I agree. Although I will say that like, I guess in line with expectation for me, at least, is like, while he did go on about how she's a very skilled hunter, huntress in her own right, the thing is, it falls into that, like, stereotypical, like, women, if they are good at it, are going to be good with the long range, kind of far away stuff and not with the hand to hand because you have the element of, like, you're far away and with a bow, right? It's completely different from hand to hand combat. You're not dealing with the physical weight of someone close to you. Like, you know, because he didn't say, you know, she was great at wrestling or, 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 you know, boxing or something. So it kind of made sense. And then because she was in this vulnerable position, like, she literally had to deal with a very, from what I was imagining, right, the way he, Croc has described, is a very heavy man with a very portly stomach, which would add to the fact that she is a small woman with a very small frame. So I was like, okay, that kind of tracks. And ha- from having, I don't know, like I did mixed martial arts as a kid, and like I learned to try to use an opponent's weight against them but let me tell you as a small 5'2 woman myself it's hard like you have to have like perfect technique and if you're not like taught that that does you're that's a fair that is a fair point oh maybe i'm just angry I yeah no i hate it too like i i hate it i hate it it's one of my least favorite parts of the book which is the way in which it's done and described and like why is it there? <laughs> like, yes, I could have done without that. I could have done with the more River God style of, and it happened. And now we move on. What I do want to move on to, though, is, yeah, Nefer's older sister, Hereset. 
I found it really interesting that presumably, like all of Mem's children, Taita would have been there to be a warming, welcoming presence the way he had. And he describes her as being very beautiful, like her grandmother. So he's all, she reminds me of her grandmother. And it's so sad and depressing. And I, uh, oh my gosh, I'm dying. Like, so how could she veer so far away? Like the fact that she falls in love with Naja and becomes like his little minion and is actively rooting for her brother's demise it's a really weird turn because I'm like, what? Yeah, it felt very much out of the blue. And I could absolutely get behind, you know, her being excited about her wedding. Her husband to be is very attractive. He's very powerful. He's never been anything but nice and kind to her. You know, in the ancient world, those are pretty good qualities for a husband. You want someone who's going to be nice and kind to you, who is able to provide for you, because as a woman, you're limited, really, in what you can do for yourself. So... Yeah, her being excited about her wedding, fantastic. Apparently, he's super good in bed. Great. Always good news if you're losing your virginity. I mean, good news generally, but especially if you're losing your virginity. And then she mentions, like, what a great pharaoh he'd be. And he's like, hmm, I would, wouldn't I? And you'd be a wonderful queen, my dear. And she's like, could that ever happen? Like, hypothetically, do you think? And he looks at her and he said, well, there is one thing in our way. And like, she doesn't say anything, but the narrative tells you that she's super on board with killing her younger brother so that her husband can be king. And it's totally out of the blue and very, very odd. And yes, I see it being necessary for the narrative and it gives you another person to dis... Well, actually, it's not necessary for the narrative. It gives you another person to dislike, but she could just be in love with him and not realize that he's planning on killing her brother. That would be fine. We don't need her to be this randomly evil woman plotting to kill her brother. So, yeah, it was weird. It just doesn't track with, like, her family's lineage. Like, I feel like Taita would be so disappointed because if he had any part in raising her, you know Taita would have raised these kids right to, like, revere their grandmother and the legacy of Mimosa and tell them, like tell them stories about Tannis. Like he told Neffer all the stories about his campaigns and the war and Tannis. So I'm like, why did the girls? Yeah. And there's no real explanation given for it. And absolutely, I can't remember if it was explicitly stated, but the sense I got was very much tight to raise these kids. He's going to have raised them all in the same way, most likely. And one doesn't just randomly turn out evil. People unless they have a like, deep, deep psychological trauma, don't necessarily just turn out evil. There's no motivation given apart from really great sex, which is shitty motivation, if we're honest. None of it is, well, none of that particular bit is believable. Like, maybe if she was super jealous of Nefa, if there was this big thing made of her being secretly jealous because her brother was going to be Pharaoh and she's just a daughter and she'll never have any power or influence. Okay. I mean, still a little weird given that Taita raised her and like we've said, we would expect certain values to be instilled in her by him. But at least there is a motive. Yeah, I don't know. It was, it was Yeah, odd. it's really bizarre. Also, it's funny because it did get me thinking like, when it seemed like her only reason was my husband is beautiful and he gives me great sex. I was like, you know, I understand in popular culture, we like to bandy about the sort of saying or phrase, oh, X, Y, or Z. It was so amazing. It was better than sex. And I was like, I have never felt that more strongly in my life because I was like, there's a lot of things, okay, that actually could be better than good. Like good sex is like good, but like, Come on, there's no dude in the whole world who's going to give you such mind-blowing sex that you're like, suddenly, I want my brother to die. I mean, I'm like, look, man, I had, like, the most perfect pizza the other day, and I was like, ah, oh, that's better than sex, because, you know what, I have a full stomach full of delicious food. So I'm kind of like, if we as humans say that all the time, jokingly about things, but, like, half the time we're kind of like, but it is kind of true, I really like this. So I'm like, I'm sure that exists in the ancient world. So I'm like, why, honey? That is the most unrealistic thing I have read and it out was, of all of this. It was on their first, like, time alone, their first night together. They just got married. It's not like she goes in 
and loves her brother and is very happy to be married but still loves her brother and then like a month two months a year down the line like Naja has worked on her to persuade her that this is something she should be doing to uh, like be his accomplice no it's their wedding night and she's like yeah sure let's murder my brother why the hell not no also though like super unrealistically i was kind of just like you tell me who the hell comes away from their first time having sex as a virgin being like i it was amazing <laughs> mind blown. i'm sorry i was like that is so unrealistic just like as a woman having had many conversations with female friends everyone kind of agrees your first time kind of sucks like you don't really know what's happening even if your partner is more like experienced you still are like a virgin so you're also your body is not like ready you know some kind of like that was the most unrealistic thing actually reading as a woman because like <laughs> I'm and, sorry. Then, and then and then when he ejaculated it made her orgasm on your first time honey yeah really i'm just like she so uh, you can clearly tell this book is written by a man because he thinks one that your first time as a woman is mind-blowingly good and then you orgasm. like uh, no i'm sorry that is actually the most unrealistic of all the things in this book full of unrealistic things yeah yeah that yeah. was i know i'm just i'm like this is so clearly written by a man like, you can't fool me but yeah so i don't like how there was like zero character development from her but we have a lot of forced and otherwise mar marriages in this way. now i figured you as a seriologist we're gonna have some fun because they did mention the king of assyria many times so did you actually get a huge kick out of the fact that they were like and king sargon sent this i was intrigued let's say i was intrigued by the many well not many but the several assyrian mesopotamian characters that turn up in this book yes so there are four maybe total there's a doctor who examines nepa's body to determine if he's actually dead there is i think a trader there is another magician who appears right at the very end and there is obviously king sargon who doesn't you don't see him but he is spoken of regularly it will surprise no one to learn that i have issues with every single one of these characters the doctor is like the description of him is anti-semitic i think we can go with he is described as having a hooked nose which is one of the more prevalent tropes i think for semitic peoples being described in media he was also deeply incompetent as a doctor and i mean Taita obviously has very little time for anyone's expertise except his own but yes the physical description of this gentleman was uncomfortable the other two that we see the trader is called ninorta and the magician is called ishtar now both of these are men ninorta is the name of a mesopotamian god so you know genders do line up there but no one is just called the same name as a god in mesopotamia ever it's like no and names and brianna kind of flagged up the name thing for river god as well so this wasn't a massive surprise but in mesopotamia names are typically whole sentences like ninorta gave me a son nabu established the lineage or like made firm my throne or you know whole sentences ishtar protects would be a perfectly reasonable you know mesopotamian name fantastic so just to call someone Ninorta, I mean, points for getting the right culture, good job, but this is not a mortal name, this is a god's name, so maybe do a little bit more research next time. Ishtar is a goddess, a super powerful, very well-known goddess, and a male magician in this book is just called Ishtar, which just was weird and wrong and weird and, and wrong, and like, why would you do that? I, it does make me wonder where he found these names. Did he just, I, Google mm, was kind of a thing when this was written. Did he just like Google Mesopotamian names and go with a list of divine names and not bother to actually research who the gods are? Who knows? But Ishtar turns up as a male magician. Very strange. And then we get to the kind of crux of the matter. 
the Hyksos ruled Egypt like roughly 1600, like mid 1600s to 1530. There are two Sargons in Mesopotamian history. One died in 705 BCE, so several centuries after this, and the other one died in 2279 BCE, several centuries before this. There is no Sargon ruling in Mesopotamia during the Second Intermediate Period. Like, we have very well documented history for Mesopotamia for 4,000 years. We, like, some spots are a little patchy, but generally speaking, we have a lot of documentation. Fucking pick a king who actually was ruling at the right time, please, for the love of God. I mean, I would have, like, forgiven a hundred years or so, but really? And in, in Mesopotamia at this point was being ruled by the Hurrians anyway. So there wouldn't have been a native Mesopotamian king. The Hittites in the... Yeah, I'm looking at a timeline. Like, the Hittites sack Babylon in 1595. Like, there isn't a Sargon in Babylon at this... Yeah, anyway, sorry. Yes. So I am fascinated to see what the second half holds because it's going to be magical, I think. Very magical. Put it this way. I know what happens at the end, but I don't remember how we get there. So it's... Yeah, it's weird. It's like filling in details of a of a lost memory. Can we mention also before we wrap up the fact that this book, the outline of it is essentially identical to River God? Yeah, that's where I kind of wanted to go, which was like, there are a lot of tropes used in the first that make repeated appearances, just new characters and different context. It seems like he just has a very staid structure, let's say, and he doesn't want to kind of like go away from mm -hmm. that. But you, but it's interesting because you have to set it up because it, like it is a different book, so you do have to make it different. So there's like enough differences that like it could get published because it's different. Mm -hmm. but, but also, Taita takes a young person under his wing, whom he has essentially raised and loves very much, and like nurtures them towards adulthood. There's a foreign princess falling in love at first sight with an Egyptian prince, who she then kind of gets rescued slash abducted. There is a betrayal by someone who is supposed to be very trusted advisor to the throne. There is the rightful ruler of Egypt being essentially driven out, forced to flee to a foreign country. And we're only halfway through the book. Oh, and don't forget, we have the very stereotypical faked death. Oh my god, I forgot about that. Yeah, we have the faked death and we have the attempted suicide. Yeah. By the Which same, happened. and obviously not the same characters, but the characters who hold the same places in the narrative do exactly the same things. Nefer and Tanis both fake their deaths. I mean, Nefer doesn't fake his own death, but his death is faked. And then Lostris and Mintaka both try and kill themselves upon hearing that their beloved, whom they cannot marry, has died. Uh, please. It's really? like cut and paste it's like cut and paste thing that happens i honestly like the only thing he added really was magic for taita and a different period in time 60 years later also it was quite interesting his description of the treaty and deciding to have co-pharaohs both wearing the double crown I mean, I'm not an Egyptologist by trade, but I'm still like, that doesn't seem correct that you would willingly have both of them seated next to each other, both wearing double crowns. And I know from history that the second intermediate period was a long period of infighting, and it only resolves itself with essentially a pharaoh winning a war and uniting the two one dude not two people so that's strange i mean the whole embassy kind of was strange what else do we i mean we don't have everyone fleeing down the cataracts but you do have taita going up to Bubaris in lower egypt so there is a journey where he goes into a new quote-unquote foreign place and has to teach these 
peoples, the wiles of what he knows. And like the way he described coming into a plague ridden lower Egypt, it was kind of like the same, same as the first book, right? Which is like wild land where they can't handle their shit. And now I need to come in and teach them what's right. So you're like, okay, sure. I can't believe he packed all that into the first, only the first half of the book. To be fair, the first half is 320 odd pages. So it's just, which is long enough to be. It's longer than some of the whole books, books. Yeah, that we read last last season. So yeah. So I mean, I guess, what are you hoping for in the second half? I am expecting an enjoyable, entertaining read, because that is what these books are. They're fun. They're entertaining. I am not anticipating any kind of historical accuracy when we get to Babylon. Unfortunately, it just doesn't, the names do not fill me with hope. Having Sargon on the throne also does not fill me with hope. So I will be interested to see what it's like. And especially with Wilbur Smith's descriptions, I think it'll be beautifully described and I I will enjoy reading it, but I'm not hoping for any kind of accuracy. How about you? Yeah, I think, well, and it's kind of sad to say, right? Because like the first book wasn't super accurate either. So it's a bit depressing to know that like, I think from what I remember from both the rest of this book and the rest of the series, which I have read, I think the first book is like the most accurate of the five. (laughs) So I think we're going to have to just, you know, forget accuracy, forget anything historical and just take it as a piece of well-written fiction which fine because i love historical fiction it's great but yeah i just i think it's odd to like because he kind of tries to sort of keep with a vaguely historical timeline but you can tell like he is taking liberty so i feel like what started with the initial second intermediate period hyksos invasion i feel like by shooting it forward some whatever years he's chosen like he's trying to start us away from like a historical timeline which i think would actually benefit the book and everything else so maybe putting a random sargon on the throne is his attempt to be like well there's a either like i'm gonna just go there and be like now we're going into his fictional mesopotamia where i can have whatever i want or he's maybe trying to make a statement about how like there could have been a fake shadowy sargon somewhere the way that we don't know whether there was a pharaoh between like akhenaten and tut you know there's because we think there's like the the shadowy i mean to, to be fair what he's working with is one of the more patchy places in mesopotamian history but also just i don't know It's, I mean, I get it, right? But I feel that if you're writing historical fiction, just do a little due diligence, even just with the naming thing. I could forgive having a fictional Sargon and a, and a historical Mesopotamia. Just try and get a name right. Yeah. Don't give people God names. I mean, I guess because presumably in the second half, Nefer is going to have grown into an actual warrior and he's going to come back and try to like get his throne. I guess I'm hoping that we get like a large battle scene because like we had battles in the first book, but they, I guess they were a bit short and like, because you, he always had something fantastical sort of happen. Like you have the initial invasion, but like you cut that short because, oh no, mimosa was hit with an arrow so all of your characters board on the royal barge and flee so then you're like well i guess there was the rest of the battle and then you have like a sort of description of the chariots advancing but also being told from first person taita is never in the battle so you hear of them so i'm kind of hoping that the way this one's written you know we get like an actual battle and it's interesting because in some of the stuff in the first half what he describes like I remember from history, but I'm also like you're using mythology and combining it with like things that we are told happen, but like Egyptianizing, like the whole when he's trying to convince people that he's a magician, he literally was stealing right out of the page, like right out of the book of Exodus with turning his staff into a cobra. I'm like, 
oh yes we've heard this before that was moses that was moses not taita but apparently taita puts his staff taita is also moses this is what we're getting at like that one was the one that stuck out but i know there was another sort of weird biblical reference oh yes where he says i can turn your water into like wine yep. or whatever yeah and he does and only one he has princesses yeah so i was like okay there's a lot of weird like biblical references so if you're gonna go to like this biblical mythology just go like and the, yeah i heard into it the book kind of occupies this weird space in historical fiction where it's historical fiction but it's also fantasy because i can kind of with River God, he had all these visions and you know what? Okay, cool. That can, I'm happy with that being in strict historical fiction because people have visions. Like you take some drugs or you drink too much or you just have a hallucination. It happens. And these are often explained as religious experiences. So Taita having them and seeing them as messages from the gods. Yep, that happens. That still happens. Cool we've kind of crossed over into Taita actually has magical powers and can like, yeah, turn things into other things. And they're the kind of conjuring tricks that you can't necessarily explain as being a sleight of hand thing. He like finds a scorpion in a girl's ear at one point. Like, I mean, okay, if you're carrying around a scorpion, that's a little weird, but I can see that being sleight of hand. The staff to Cobra I don't understand how that could, that's not him tricking someone. That's him actually having magical powers. So it's, we've crossed a line. It feels a little bit odd because that's the only way that we've crossed that particular realism fantasy line. And it feels like Taita is the only person who has made that transition. Everyone else, it feels like is still living in the physical world that we all know and love. Yeah, like, I guess, like, with the exception of, like, the mazes, which were the only sort of magical element. No, like, the first book felt grounded in kind of, like, reality because you have these visceral experiences, you have on-the-ground stuff, there's not much magic. But even, but sorry, yeah, definitely... in, even with the mazes, I could understand that as a self-induced hallucination. Mm -hmm. Like, it's not... Yeah, so that's, like, that's still grounded in reality because you can understand how physically and like you could put yourself as a human in that position no you're right i think like this book and continuing on for the others in the series i think it does like once you get into his magus territory it does go from a grounded historical fiction feel into definitely historical low fantasy because it's not high fantasy for sure but like so i guess i would say like a historical low fantasy because yeah there's no other way i could account for like these sort of mystical things that are happening and this is only like book two right of a five book series because like his magical powers end up being like so much more and if i remember correctly he invents so much more shit when he starts traveling so i'm kind of like time machine and xyz i don't know yeah so so i guess what i want to see is if you're going to lean hard into this shift into sort of more historical fantasy then I really want to see you play up the fantastical element. So I would like to see more growth from Taita in the fantastical side. I would like to learn more about where these mysterious powers come from. Because if you're so clearly going to not hew to the history part, then um, to make it interesting. Some kind of you know, explanation would be nice. Yeah, exactly. So I don't know. Like, And you know what? I think coming back to these books now at my age, I'm like, I think like I'm reminded that I did really enjoy reading them the first time and I'm still enjoying myself. So, and that's the important thing. If you want like a, an entertaining read that yes, has violent, weird, gross exposition of people parts, but like overall, if you want an entertaining story, yeah, I would be like, I would still recommend this be like, you know, trigger warning, but like fun thing to read. It's like a holiday yeah. book. It's a book you take on vacation. You read it on the beach. Yeah. Yeah. If you want to just disappear to this land of mystical, magical Egypt where there's weird things, sure. But yeah, I would not. Yeah. I don't know. I would still recommend it, but I'm, you know, maybe I'll have a different opinion after the second half, but I'm not sure. But yeah, I hope it leans into like this more fantasy element because that's clearly where it's going. So yeah, but I don't know. Still enjoying it halfway through. Awesome. Well, we'll meet back here next week. Everyone else do your reading. Let us know what you think. 
Hey, thanks for listening. Don't forget to leave us a review. And you can also follow us on social media at The Reading Party Podcast. If you'd like to leave us a book or movie suggestion, then email us at thereadingpartypod at gmail.com. See you next week. Mm-hmm.